The Wired Gourmet is essentially a culinary channel, so naturally I'm going to examine the V60 with one goal, better tasting coffee. Most of the pour over theory and technique you find online is rooted in cafe industry wisdom. And while there's a lot of experience behind it, there's also an inescapable profit requirement. Whether consciously or not, cafe trained YouTubers lean toward commercial rather than gastronomic considerations. For example, it might be profitable for a coffee shop to use a certain brewing ratio, one that tastes pretty good to most people and earns a respectable return. I mean the standard 1 to 16 ratio that most people recommend. I imagine it's profitable, but from a culinary point of view, it's nothing special. I certainly don't love it. It might also pay to insert extra steps to amuse customers, thereby encouraging repeat business. Enriching your brewing process with pseudo-scientific or quasi-religious airs and graces might draw an appreciative crowd. But at home, you and I don't have customers. We have family. We have guests. Ratios and methods should be based entirely on flavor, not efficiency or theatrical value. So we're going to sweep the cafe nonsense aside and get to the heart of this wonderful device. Our motto is simple. If it works, it's right. And if it tastes good, it is good. So let's take a fresh approach to V60 brewing, free from the familiar chorus, and find out what really matters. I'm going to reconsider everything. Dripper design, paper qualities, pouring technique, grinders and grind characteristics, slurry temperatures, contact times, and brewing ratios. By the end of this video, you will have learned which devices and items of kit and which methods make a real difference on the palate, and which ones are meant more to impress customers or squeeze a few extra cups out of a kilo of beans. We're going to slaughter a few sacred cows along the way and violate a number of regulations and possibly offend the authorities, but only in pursuit of better tasting coffee, so it's all right. This will be a long one with original material you haven't seen elsewhere, so get nice and comfortable while I preach some V60 voodoo. Oh. My. God. It's like a miracle. I'll jump in and explain things while I brew some coffee for you. I will cover everything today. I'm just not willing to structure this like a textbook or a training course. I'm simply going to chat over coffee. I'll do the first batch in a single take with a timer visible so that you can see the complete process and get an accurate feel for it. First, you've got to choose your brewing ratio. It can be anything you like. There's nothing magical about the 1 to 16 ratio that many cafes use. I strongly prefer 1 to 10. I use a cheap Chinese-made scale that cost me under 10 euros and has survived a couple of years of daily use, still on its first pair of batteries. It has one-tenth of a gram resolution and accuracy of around two-tenths of a gram, which is perfectly adequate. Weigh the coffee and measure the water for your preferred ratio, whatever that is. You can expect each gram of dry coffee to absorb around 2 grams of water, so if you use 35 grams of coffee with 420 milliliters of water, that will yield around 350 milliliters of brewed coffee. Your mileage may vary, but that's a fair estimate. My grinder, a modified specialita that I introduced in a recent video, is dialed in for a 5-minute brew with the Kinto paper filter I'll be using. I'll talk more about that later. I recommend a slurry temperature around 88 to 90 degrees Celsius or 190 to 195 degrees Fahrenheit. So the water you pour should be around 96 degrees Celsius or 205 degrees Fahrenheit. Of course, you can bump it up or down a little depending on your ratio and technique and the type of coffee you use. I crease the paper sharply so that the seam will remain closed during the brew. 
I use a narrow spoon with a long handle so that I can move dry particles out of the tip of the paper cone. Make a little depression so there's less dry coffee in the center. This way, when you pour, the water will travel the same distance in all directions to wet the grounds. Well, more or less. And now I'll perform a one-take pour-over brew in five minutes. No editing, no nonsense. I always pour in 30-second intervals. I start with a pre-infusion of one minute divided into two equal steps because that works better than a single pour. I count this toward the overall brew time. It's just simpler that way. There's no need to weigh or measure anything now. You've already done that. A scale would only be a distraction. Just pour a sensible amount of water to wet the particles. Use your spoon gently to find and break any lumps. Most importantly, don't let dry coffee clog the narrow part of the paper cone. It could impede the flow throughout the rest of the brew. At 30 seconds, add some more water to loosen the slurry. Intuitively, it seems as if the first pour prepares the coffee for the second. Again, feel for dry lumps and check the bottom gently. All of the coffee should be in contact with water by now. There will be a lot of foam this time. It does seem like a slightly different process. Now, after 15 or 20 seconds, when the level is low enough, lift the filter, give it a 64th of a turn, center it, and reseed it gently. This is important because when you first add water, everything starts to move and the tip of the cone can get wrinkled or twisted, which will obstruct the flow and make your timing inconsistent. But don't ever do this when the filter is full. The weight of water and wet coffee can split the seam. Continue agitating. It ensures thorough and even extraction by redistributing the coffee and equalizing the slurry temperature. Pour a sensible amount every 30 seconds. I always maintain fixed intervals between pours. This is the key to consistent results and good timing. Forget about percolation. It makes for inconsistency. Water is a solvent. If the coffee dissolved in it is more concentrated here and less so there, you'll get uneven extraction because your solvent will be more or less saturated. We want the water moving through the brew to distribute the coffee, equalize the temperatures, and equalize the concentration of dissolved solids. Frequent agitation eliminates any silly concerns about water bypass, since each pour will quickly reach a consistent concentration. The idea that water needs to percolate gently like raindrops through fertile soil is a ridiculous fable. All you can accomplish with that approach will be layers of different solvent concentrations and layers of varying temperatures, and both of those are bad. Treating this with delicate reverence as if it were a religious ceremony is mere cafe drama. Don't be taken in. This is coffee, not the Holy Eucharist. You can sweep around the top edge to dislodge the bigger floating bits and stir up the coffee bed regularly to smooth out any temperature differences and to prevent channeling. Just avoid disturbing the fines that cling to the sides in the middle area. You don't want to dislodge them, so avoid scraping the sides of the filter below the surface. And pour gently, or you'll create an undercurrent that will wash the fines off the opposite side of the paper. If you leave the fines largely undisturbed, you'll be better able to read the bed of spent grounds, which I'll get to. Eyeballing the amount you pour is fine. A few milliliters more water in this pour and a few less in that one is of no consequence. Some cafes weigh each pour to impress customers. But really, once you establish your brewing ratio and grind and choose your water temperature, the only remaining factor you need to watch is the contact time. It has a real effect on the palate. Too long and you'll extract unwelcome flavors from the powdery fines. Too short, and the coffee will lack complexity and balance. If I were brewing a larger amount, I might grind the coffee a hair coarser to accommodate my time target. 
Toward the end of the final drawdown, you can lift and reseat the filter if it's not too full and you do it carefully. This isn't strictly necessary, and if the brew is proceeding all right and you feel it's a bit risky, you can skip it. But sometimes, a V60 brew slows dramatically toward the end, and reseating the paper can fix it. I'll explain how that works a bit later. As I said, I have this grinder dialed in for five minutes with these papers. We're approaching the target, and we're just about empty. And there we go, five minutes to the second. Who's your daddy? So how many rules did I just break? <laughs> All of them, I suspect. But the idea that pour over should be a strict percolation is made up nonsense based on absolutely nothing. It most likely started as marketing puffery in third wave cafes, an international echo chamber where foolish ideas propagate like STDs in a frat house. The technique I just showed you is a mechanically sound process. Easily the soundest one on YouTube, I think. Let's call it the Wired Gourmet V60 Voodoo Method. But we're just getting started. You have to go beyond solid mechanics. You'll need to troubleshoot problems and disappointments adapt to your equipment, and most importantly, optimize the process to suit your own taste. You're going to have to tweak this on your own, but I'm going to help you do that. So let's dig in. First, I'll show you how your choice of paper can influence brewing time. Here, I'm using the same coffee, ratio, grinder settings, and so on. The only thing I'm changing is the paper, from the Kinto cotton ones to Hario boxed brown papers. The first brew was five minutes. Let's see how this one goes. What we're doing is paper filtered immersion, and it's the best of both worlds. It's more complicated than plain immersion, like with a French press, for example. We have to grind with precision and watch our intervals and pour with the right technique and choose the right combinations of kit to avoid brew times that are too long or too short or pour extractions either over or under. Choosing your filter papers is a bit of a trial and only experience can guide you. Hario makes five different types Cafec makes, by my count, 11, plus other shapes. And Kinto makes one, which I happen to like. So that makes 17 choices of V60 paper that I'm aware of. Try them all if you like. Just keep in mind what you're looking for on the palette and take note of how easy or difficult it is to get there. In general, you'll prefer faster papers for conical burr grinders, where you typically get more fines, and slower ones for flat burrs, where you typically get fewer. Faster ones for darker roasts, slower ones for light. Faster ones for low density beans, slower ones for high, and so on. I think you can sense the pattern here. For my slow paper, I like the Kinto Whites, which contain some cotton pulp. I use them with my flat burr grinders. They're flavorless and don't need rinsing. They're quite strong, so you can reseat them without fear. These are my default. I'll dial in the grind for five, five and a half, or six minutes, depending on the coffee I'm using. For my quick paper, I like the Hario boxed brown ones. These are what I use with my conical burr grinders, both of which produce a generous lot of fines. These also have no flavor and don't need rinsing, but they're not sturdy, so take care when you reseat them. Usually, if something goes wrong, the seam will fail, but I have seen a couple with hole. So are there any papers you should avoid? Everything I've used that's made for the V60 has been good quality, from Hario, Cafec, or Kinto. I haven't tried any dollar store or Walmart brands, but I have encountered two bad tasting filters that could ruin your coffee. First is anything made by Melita. These don't smell odd when they get wet, but they contribute a distinct and overwhelming flavor of toxic waste. Fortunately, Cafec makes quality papers of the same shape, so you can rescue your old Melita dripper. 
Second, we have the Chemex brown papers, which smell and taste of wet, rotting cardboard strongly enough to destroy a pot of coffee. The white ones are wasteful, and I think they blunt the coffee's flavor, but there's nothing foul. The brown ones, though, are unusable. And while we're on the subject, I'll just add that metal pour-over screens are among the worst inventions of all time. Coffee grit just runs through them, making for a mouthful of slurry. If you want that oily, rich textured coffee experience, be smart and use a French press. You'll end up with a lot less grit in your cup. That's the right design for metal filtering. So there we are, with 4 minutes and 15 seconds on the clock. Hario Browns are clearly faster. This is just an example to illustrate that paper characteristics can have a substantial effect on your timing. You'll need to try different papers and decide what suits your own grinder and funnel and coffee. I'm happy to narrow it down to a pair of personal favorites, but if you prefer to keep an array of filters with subtle differences, by all means enjoy yourself. Cafec has a remarkable assortment that will keep you busy for ages. And if you like it simplified, Pario boxed browns are fast, Kinto white cottons are slow, and both are good quality. Now look at all these different funnels. Some have large openings, others are small. The smallest is the Hario glass one at around 18 millimeters. The Kinto ceramic one here is 28 and a half, and this open petal gadget is around 32. Does this matter? It does, only not in the way you would think. The effect on flow characteristics is negligible. The difference is a mechanical advantage. A funnel with a narrow opening will support the paper better, especially the seam, so it might be safer for reseeding a more delicate filter. If you use strong papers, the opening size makes no appreciable difference. So, for example, when I use Hario paper, which is not that sturdy, I always use Hario funnels, which are narrow and supportive. When I use Kinto paper, which is sturdy, I don't worry about which dripper I use. Next, have you ever wondered if these ridges inside have a real purpose? Actually, they matter a lot. They encourage flow, and the way they do that is interesting enough to make me want to show you. Here I'm using a bare metal holder, which is really minimal and has flat surfaces. I'm using 25 grams of my normal pour-over grind. Look how long this brew is taking. 12 minutes! That's nuts! The coffee will be ice cold and grossly over extracted. I would have to grind a lot coarser to make this work, but that would be bad for flavor, so I never use this for brewing, but this is a good illustration. It's clear to me that the lack of ridges means crazy slow dripping, but why is that? When you brew, the paper fibers will absorb water and swell, some more than others. Pores become smaller whenever hot water gets involved. The liquid also exerts outward force, pushing the paper fibers closer together still. It's similar to the Three Stooges effect, water trying to pass through a lot of crowded openings all at once. Fibers pushed apart by water will push their neighbors closed, so what you get is a stalemate. Surface ridges inside the funnel speed up the flow by varying the angles at which water contacts the paper, thereby breaking the symmetry, like Mo poking Larry in the eyes to rush past him. That was a good episode, wasn't it? This is why reseeding the paper toward the end of the brew can fix that tail end slowdown. The coffee bed may settle, establishing a symmetry of its own. When you reseat the paper, the ridges press against the filter at different points and break the stalemate with fresh angles of attack. And for a bonus, now you know why the Kalita Wave can work with no ridges in the dripper. This glass holder is perfectly smooth. The wavy paper itself breaks the symmetry instead of the holder. So funnel design can influence brewing speed as much as paper choice, perhaps more. 
Based on my own experience, the Hario spiral design is a bit faster than the Kinto straight one, all other things being equal, but of course your mileage may vary. Will your choice of funnel affect temperature control? Oh, it will indeed. Let me show you. I'll pour the same temperature water for both examples. I'm using a thermocouple which reads immediately, so the display changes rapidly. You might find it a bit irritating, but common types of thermometers have too much lag. Heat flow is a jittery business. Gradual temperature transitions are a familiar illusion caused by laggy devices. This heavy glass dripper gives me a slurry temperature of around 88 degrees Celsius or 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Notice how it varies as I move the probe. This is why I like to agitate. But now, when I use the lightweight metal holder to keep the filter away from the glass, the peak temperature increases and reaches around 90 degrees Celsius or 194 or 5 degrees Fahrenheit. So the greater the funnel's mass, the more effective it is as a heat sink, you know, practically speaking. You can always preheat a heavy one, but the little rinse with hot water that we see so often will not cut it. So for everyday brewing, I prefer one of these plastic funnels, which are very lightweight and don't need preheating. So to wrap up our dripper discussion, the chief considerations are speed, which is affected by the ridge pattern inside, and mass, which determines whether or not you should preheat it. The opening size might matter if you use fragile papers, but it doesn't affect the brew very much. We saw, for example, that the metal holder is by far the slowest, despite having the biggest hole. Now let's talk about grinding. In general, for V60 brewing, you should always grind as fine as you can get away with. And by getting away with it, I mean consistently hitting a time target of your choice in the sensible range of four to six minutes. But let's say you bought a grinder for espresso and now you're getting into V60 brewing. Did you get the wrong machine? People believe that grinders are designed for single purposes and sometimes that's true. But the idea that you'll need a new gadget is the result of one-dimensional thinking. It's only partly true. It's only a tendency. Often, you can compensate for it. An espresso-focused grinder is likely to produce a lot of fines that can lead to over-extraction in pour-over devices. When I say over-extraction, I mean the extraction of undesirable flavor compounds. That's a function of small particle size with high slurry temperatures and a long contact time. Fortunately, we can adjust all of those variables. Let's look at an example. I sometimes use what many would say is the wrong machine for pour over. My conical burr grinder makes a tremendous lot of fines when I grind in the V60 range, as I showed you in a previous video. I might set it coarser or finer overall, but the proportion of tiny particles will always be high. And those fines tend to get overcooked, releasing stale, astringent flavors. Most people would advise you to grind coarser to compensate, but it's not that simple. In fact, that's wrong. If you grind coarse, you'll get too many big particles that will only extract partially. The fines will give you some texture, but the flavor will be weak and probably sour. You always want to grind as fine as you can to maximize surface area for better extraction. The real solution is to speed up the process without grinding too coarse. Switching to a fast paper and a fast funnel is the better choice. I use the Hario boxed brown papers with a Hario funnel, as that's the fastest rig I've got. I then dial in the grinder for four minutes exactly. That's quick enough to avoid overcooking the fines with an overall particle size small enough for good flavor extraction. I also reduce my slurry temperature to around 88 degrees Celsius or 190 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough for a good extraction in four minutes with less risk of overcooking those powdery bits. What I get is delicious pour over from a grinder that many experts claim is unsuited to the task. I taste richness without astringency and plenty of dynamic range. 
it's a bit rounder and mellower than the coffee I get from flat burrs, but let's stop saying that like it's a bad thing, all right? If you have an espresso-focused grinder, then fast paper, a fast funnel, and a lower slurry temperature will yield a delicious pot of pour-over coffee once you get it dialed in. The aftermath of a brew can tell you a few things if you learn to read it. But I have a little problem with chaff covering the coffee, so I finally found a use for this silly crove thing. I can sieve out the chaff so that we can see the coffee more clearly. I want to show you how to read the coffee bed so that you can tweak your brew off of it. Here I've got three samples with chaff. Everything was identical except the grinders, and there's a clear difference across the board here. The appearance of chaff becomes a unit of measure. The niche buries it in fines, so none is visible. The Oro single dose leaves fines on the sides of the paper with a little bit of spillover, so the chaff is only partly hidden and the Specialita, modded with brew-specific burrs, shows all of the chaff, indicating that virtually all of the fines are clinging to the sides. You can work with this, but I think I can do better than this. So here are the sifted samples. In this case, I kept everything the same except the papers. They're sitting in different funnels here, but they were both brewed in the Hario glass one. I ground these samples with the modded Specialita. You can see at a glance that the slower paper trapped fewer fines on the sides. But this is not really important for flavor, as the fines will extract regardless of whether they're stuck to the sides or floating around. They're submerged in both cases. But the aftermath gives you some idea of where to begin tweaking, how to set your variable. The issue affecting flavor is the proportion of fines to characteristic particle. If you see a lot of mud here, you might wish to increase overall particle size, or your paper and funnel speeds, or lower your slurry temperature, or all of the above. You can also see a perfectly flat coffee bed free from any hints of channeling. But since my voodoo method calls for regular agitation, this had better be perfectly flat. If it isn't, then you must be doing this at sea. All right, we've covered a lot of material. I think that now you can see that techniques and recipes are only part of the story, only the first steps. I honestly believe that this video can help you understand pour-over coffee and recognize which characteristics are connected to technique and which are connected to devices and gear. You're free to tune out the familiar chorus of world champion espresso machine operators being follow the leader. There is no ultimate technique, although my voodoo method is a solid foundation on which you can build and pursue the flavor that suits you personally. I'm sincerely looking for a fourth wave in coffee, more home-oriented, more gastronomically grounded, with greater independence from the cafe industry's interests and goals. I may have eliminated the hocus pocus and commercial puffery, but it's up to you to taste and test and tweak. I hope I've given you the understanding and the tools you need. The culinary approach is the one true path, and the wired gourmet is the one true master. Well, that's about all for today. Coming up soon, a thorough teardown of the Niche Zero to learn if it really is too lightly built, as some users insist. And a thorough test of the Nine Barista Espresso Maker, which might just be competitive with the Cafelat robot for true espresso on a budget. So keep in touch. Cheers! <laughs>